Dames en heren, gaat u zitten. Dames en heren, ladies and gentlemen, geachte collega's, dear colleagues. Welkom op de openbare doctoraatsverdediging van Wouter Baart. Ik verklaar de zitting voor geopend. De heer Wouter Baart is Master of Science in de Ingenieurswetenschappen en Computerwetenschappen van de KU Leuven. En hij heeft aan de faculteit een proef zich voorgelegd handelend over performance enhancing techniques voor Tucker Tensor Decompositions in Data Processing. En dit wil het verkrijgen van de graad van dokter in de Ingenieurswetenschappen. Hij zal dit proefschrift nu verdedigen. Meneer Baart, ik vraag u om uw werk voor te stellen in ongeveer drie kwartier. Nadien is de gelegenheid om te discussiëren met de leden van de examencommissie. Het woord is aan u. Dank u wel, uh, meneer de voorzitter. Um, dus, goedenavond iedereen. En nogmaals welkom bij de publieke verdediging van mijn doctoraat. Ik begin even in Nederlands, omdat uh, ik dus heb gepost bij de aanwezigen qua taalvoorkeur en taal, laat ik zeggen, vaardigheden, wat de opties zijn. En ik heb uiteindelijk besloten dat het beste is, zodat toch zoveel mensen, mogelijk mensen betrokken kunnen zijn om het in het Engels te doen vandaag. Dus ik ga de presentatie zelf in het Engels doen, maar uh, je kunt natuurlijk straks ook um, vragen stellen in het Nederlands en voor de Nederlandse taligen denk ik ook dat uh, zelfs als er problemen zouden zijn met het Engels, dat een aantal slides wel voor zich spreken en zo. Dus hopelijk is dat uh, oké. Okay. Oké, okay, now I'll continue in English. Again, uh, welcome everyone. Uh, about my public defense, I'm very happy to see so many of you here tonight. Um, I will be doing this presentation in English, that's why I just explained in Dutch. And the slides will also be in English. Now, I'm mostly very happy I managed to convince so many people to come here because many people were afraid this was going to be very technical because yes, I will be trying to explain a bit about what I did in the past four years of my PhD. Uh, titled Performance Enhancing Techniques for Tucker Tensor Decompositions in Data Processing. And like with most public defenses, I think this title probably scares many people or confuses them, um, but this is normal. Um, I would say probably to laymen, there are several questions that already are raised like this probably. What are tensors? What are Tucker Tensor Decompositions? What kind of performance are we trying to enhance with our techniques? that we developed, and uh, also what kind of data processing are we talking about, maybe. So today's goal is not to explain my research in detail, but simply to hope that you, I hope that you live with some understanding about the title, and also a very high level uh, understanding of my research work itself. Uh, and to achieve this, I'm going to try to do this in the layman's way with almost no equations, codes, other things that we do in technical presentations much way more often. Instead, I'm going to try to visualize more things. So that leads us to the following, uh, let's say, outline for this presentation. I'm going to start by uh, describing the general problem we're working on from an everyday perspective, being data compression, then how we can achieve this using Tucker decompositions, uh, using um, methods from the literature effectively. Then my own work built upon the literature involving these Tucker decompositions, the ATC compressor, uh, and a second part here is a complicated title again, but I will explain it later, about the second half of my research, slightly smaller half. And finally, I will conclude uh, and uh, do a little bit of a recap of what we learned today. First of all, what kind of problem are we looking at? Well, data can be too big to store or to transfer, and to give you some everyday ex examples of this, let's say you're watching your favorite music video and you see this little circle pop up in the middle and the video pauses. This usually means that um, data is not being sent quickly enough to you over the internet. Uh, so the video is actually, in a sense, too large to uh, be processed uh, in real time. You can also have this problem, of course, with other streaming services like Netflix or wherever you watch your TV shows. And a um, personal story of mine that I think many can probably relate to. This is a screenshot I actually took from my uh, personal laptop in the first year of my PhD. I think it had a 500 gigabyte hard disk, and somehow for the last year I was using it, I was always 99.9% .9 full or something. I, it was very impractical, I always had to delete files and such. Um, so data storage can definitely also be an issue, it's nice to have smaller files. Now luckily, uh, in the first year of my PhD, I actually managed to solve this issue thanks to my PhD, mainly using the money I earned here, I bought a better computer with a much larger hard disk. But um, I also, of course, try to resolve this issue in a more general way uh, through my research. And that's how we get to data compression. 
Uh, essentially, data compression, I would describe it here, as trying to represent the same information, or approximately the same information, but using less bits or numbers or letters depending on the context we're working. Computers work with bits, humans often work with letters. For example, for a more, let's say, human analogy, um, if you're writing a long text you might, and you write words like etc. in English, you might be uh, inclined to abbreviate them simply as etc. period. In a sense, very broad sense, that's a form of data compression because the abbreviation contains the same information to most people. It's a pattern you find in the data, um, but you need less letters to encode it. Now, even though you apply data compression like that, maybe in a very broad definition, um, you definitely do use data compression in the computer sense of the word uh, every day, probably without knowing it. For example, when you are storing images or videos on your phone, or making recordings, uh, these are stored in um, compressed file formats, such as JPEG for photos, MP4 for videos, and so on. Uh, when you stream video over the internet, different formats are used because it's a stream, but it's still um, going to be uh, compressed in some way, else the video would be too big to send over in real time. Same thing for audio, there we use MP3 and other formats. And even if you have used zip archives in the past to share whole folders with other people over email or something, actually what zip does is not just turn a big folder into a file, but also try, it tries to compress that file into a more compact format so you can send it more easily to other people. So this gives you some idea of actually how ubiquitous data compression is as it already. But to understand how it works and some of the, let's say, fundamental techniques, we should first understand the data that we are looking at, or in this case, I'm going to talk about images because they're easy to visualize, and they're also, not strictly speaking, the focus of my work. I like to focus more on other data, but it's um, related to my work, and it can be interpreted in the same uh, context. Now, uh, in the world of image compression in literature, um, there's this famous picture called Lena, which has been used for many, many years. Uh, but it's uh, actually quite controversial nowadays. Um, I won't get further into that. But instead, I thought it was better to go for a picture I got from home, so no copyright issues uh, from our cat, Luna, over there. It's only one letter difference, so I thought that would be nice. Um, so using this image, we can now actually investigate what is a computer image? How is, does it get stored? Well, here we have our image. Um, it looks just like an image, but actually if we zoom in very far, as many of you probably know, uh, actually the, pic the picture is made up of these small things called pixels, these small squares. So along the two spatial axes, um, you have these small squares, and each of these squares has their own color. Uh, we can go further. Uh, in fact, I think slightly less, but still many people if here will know that in computers, these colors are also encoded uh, using red, green, and blue components. So every color here is some kind of gray, but actually the computer stores it internally as some combination, like the right mix, pretty much, of red, green, and blue. Now here I visualized it using cubes with different uh, si um, well, shades of red, green, and blue. But effectively, um, the computer, of course, stores this using numbers. So let's say zero represents no red at all on the first layer here, and one represents, um, yeah, I guess, as much as possible on the computer. Then we can convert these cubes to numbers like this. This probably looks like a huge mess to you, but if we actually look at things like this, hmm. I'm not sure if anyone is aware of the lights that can be turned off a bit, because I'm not sure if anything here is visible. Hmm? Yeah. Is anyone more familiar with this? <laughs> okay, I'm going to continue the presentation as it is, uh, but thank you very much. All right. Um, so I think you can kind of see when I move the numbers around like this. It's a bit hard to see, but uh, essentially these numbers are on a three dimensional uh, grid. Uh, yeah, so essentially. Ah, that's working. Uh, I think that's a bit better. Yeah, you can turn it as low as you want, I think. Yeah, I think it's slightly better. Thanks. OK, so computer images are three-dimensional grids of numbers. That's what we just established. Well, then what is a video? Well, a video is a sequence of many images of the same size, one after another. That's how a computer stores a video, and by playing it, 
In rapid succession, it looks like motion to our eyes. Um, but since every image individually is already a three-dimensional grid of numbers, if you stack all these together, you actually add a time dimension to it, so then you get four dimensions. So a video is a four-dimensional grid of numbers. Uh, so effectively, these high multidimensional groups of numbers seem to pop up in many places, and luckily we have a shorter name for it in our field. We call, simply call them tensors. Uh, and I'm also going to talk about some uh, cases that uh, we focus on more, but are slightly further away from everyday life, let's say. For example, hyperspectral images are, in a sense, just like images, but instead of storing three components, red, green, and blue, along the color axis, instead, uh, colors are sampled across 200, 250, it can be all kinds of uh, numbers of uh, channels. For example, in between red, green, and blue, there might be many colors uh, that are investigated also outside of the visible spectrum, it can be anything. Secondly, in uh, medicine, specifically medical imaging, there are many applications where we run into tensors. For example, using X-ray uh, imaging, we can actually construct these 3D uh, volumetric um, data, in this case, uh, depicting someone's foot. Um, and on the right here, we actually have a visualization of something a bit more complicated, namely a diffusion tensor imaging data set, which is used in a certain specific type of uh, brain research to investigate how the brain uh, works. And this is just a visualization of one of the, uh, let's say, components in there. Uh, finally, actually, uh, I would say the most important and perhaps the broadest uh, situation where we run into these tensors with three, four, five dimensions are actually computer simulations. Um, I would say most, if not all, depending on your definition, computer or at least numerical simulations are actually uh, run on this, uh, these multidimensional grids. Uh, for example, here we have a simulation uh, of Hurricane Isabel, which hit the United States in 2003. I think it's quite clear to everyone that it's um, quite useful to society if uh, people know how to simulate these things properly. And similarly, I also believe it, there is some use to be able to store these things properly and be able to transfer them more easily to others. So how do these simulations work? Well, for example, it tries to model pressure at every point in space. This represents a three-dimensional box of pressure um, values within uh, a three-dimensional space. It's a bit hard to see, but there is a thickness to this uh, data box over here. Um, so effectively, it's storing the height in the atmosphere. It's looking at different layers simultaneously. Um, and if you continue along here, you get different time iterations of the same points in space, but uh, the values, of course, change over time, just like in the, well, real, in the real world. So since each box here is a three-dimensional grid of numbers, so a 3D tensor, um, John, can you move a bit? Thanks. <laughs> All right. So, because each um, box is a three-dimensional grid of numbers, then if you add this time dimension to it, you get a 4D tensor. And then, because actually simulation does it simultaneously for 13 variables in this case, we are actually looking at a five-dimensional tensor. I think many people probably get scared a bit when they start hearing about more than four, three dimensions, but you don't have to be able to visualize in your head. I also didn't do that in four years of my PhD on multidimensional data. Uh, that's not necessary. You can just think about it like a 2D grid of uh, 3D grids in a way. But this leads us right into the next problem, which is sometimes called cursor dimensionality, I would say. Um, when working with these the tensor data sets with three, four, or five, um, or even more dimensions, uh, we, we run into issues with data storage, uh, even more so than I would say than with images or video, because to compute the amount of numbers in the entire data set, we actually have to multiply the sizes of each dimension. So, in, for example, in the previous case, there were 13 variables. There were actually 20 time points, but that wouldn't fit on my slide, so I just showed four. Um, and actually, each 3D box of um, data represented 100 by 500 by 500 grid. So if you multiply all these numbers together, it turns out that the data sets I showed earlier consist of 6.5 billion numbers. That sounds like a lot. Luckily, you can store that on your computer, but it's going to take a decent chunk from your hard drive, and it's going to be impractical to transfer uh, on many occasions. Therefore, data compression is quite interesting to um, alleviate these issues. This leads us to the Tucker decomposition, which we're going to use to achieve data compression. So first, in general, 
on a foundation level, what do we do when we try to compress data? I would say we try to find patterns or structure in the data. For example, if I show you these two arbitrary phone numbers here, uh, I would assume most people find the first one slightly easier to remember because it, have, it has more repeating digits. However, it's equally long, so from a um, you know, basic point of view, the same amount of uh, data required a priori, but once you actually investigate how it's structured, if you instead remember the structure and not the raw data itself, you might be able to uh, store it more efficiently. However, this is a quite an easy pattern to spot. Uh, in practice, data, especially if you look at large arrays of numbers, can be very hard for human to find these patterns. So instead, we have the computer do that for us. But I'm going to try to at least visualize a bit what the computer can do for us in this sense. So here we have our three-dimensional grid of numbers again. If I turn it like this, it's easier to see. Well, easy to see is three-dimensional. Unfortunately, the lighting is still annoying, but um, ah, that's a bit better. Great. Uh, so if we look at our grid from this perspective, we have this nice view where each pixel's um, coordinates are just displayed together in this little box. Uh, you could call this a group of three numbers or a vector or whatever. Uh, we call it a vector in our field. Now, um, I'm going to throw an idea out there that might sound strange to many people, but it's actually a very standard idea to us, which is let's look at uh, these vectors, so each of these groups of three numbers, and draw them in a three-dimensional space. Now, I think many of you in high school probably at some point drew graphs in two dimensions, might have some memories of that, but three dimensions is maybe a bit uh, more advanced, I don't know. So I have a nice demonstration to show this. Let's, for example, look at the first number here. Um, it has the coordinates 0 0.28, 0 0.29, and 0 0.34. So we interpret these three numbers as the coordinates in this 3D plot over here. So the red value is plotted on the red axis over here, labeled red. And the green value is plotted over here, and the blue over here. And using the red and green components, we determine the horizontal position of the points. And using the blue component, we determine the vertical position. We can keep doing this for the other points. I just demonstrated here with uh, six in the top left corner. And if we continue this for all points, we end up with this um, plot over here. Now, if you look at it like this, um, this doesn't seem to be very random, does it? These colors are not uniformly distributed throughout this uh, cube, which they would be if they were entirely random. Uh, so clearly, there is some structure to this data. In fact, if I were to rotate the view like this, uh, you can see that the, that the points that we drew, I would say almost all of them, so pretty much all of these apart from these, uh, nicely align into this plane that uh, I can draw like this. It's a bit hard to see, but there is a very small line here now. Uh, in fact, it, they align so well that we might consider why are we working with these red, green, blue coordinates? Why don't we just um, look at these points within that plane that we uh, found pretty much approximates all of them? They are kind of in that plane. So if we remove our old axes, we can uh, turn our camera again, so we face this plane uh, directly. And now we have to rotate the data slightly more to get it to align perfectly. And now we have our new coordinate system. But as you see, there are only two axes here, a uh, vertical and horizontal one. So we are simply looking at our data uh, in terms of two numbers per point now, not in terms of three. This is very important. Now we can actually reverse the procedure again. So now we take the coordinates of the points to the right, and we arrange them into our tensor again on the left side of the screen. So for example, this was actually the first point earlier. In this rotate, from this rotated point of view, in this new coordinate system, its new coordinates are 0 0.52 and 0 0.09. So we store those over here. Um, so again, 0 0.52 is stored in the first layer of the tensor, 0 0.09 is stored in the second layer of the tensor. But I just turned the camera so they are nicely aligned on top of each other. Uh, we can continue to do this with the other points that I showed before. So these are again the six demonstration points from earlier. And if we do this again uh, for everything and we arrange them into the tensor in the same way that we extracted these points from the tensor, we don't actually change the amount of rows and columns of our tensor. We only change uh, the amount of, well, of elements along this color axis as it used to be. It used to be three, now it's two. 
All right. Um, this might still have been a bit heavy for some people, so I also like to use this other intuitive explanation of what we just did. Uh, the nice thing about colors is that we have a bit of a sense of how they can be mixed uh, intuitively. So effectively, what we did before is every color by the computer represented as some mix of the red, green, and blue um, in some amounts. It looks a bit purple here, but I can assure you in LaTeX, I really tried to yeah, get the color blue. So. In any case, um, the numbers are right mathematically. I'm not sure about the display. But however, um, we, if we were try to um, represent this color using only two colors, well, it turns out that uh, using some computer arguments, we determined that the best way to do this uh, for all colors in the image combined, kind of, is using this orange and this light blue. And indeed, it turns out for this particular color, which is a very typical color in this image that I just showed, um, you get a almost exact match, in fact. Uh, it only differs by one bit, uh, so no one here can see that. Uh, and you can just achieve that by taking a different mix of these two colors. But, as you can see, we only need to store two of these coefficients here, two of these numbers, instead of three at the top. So, we achieved 33% data reduction. Now, let's take a look at our image from before. Uh, how does it actually look if we only use these two colors? Uh, I think to some people probably there's not really a difference. If you look carefully, you actually should notice maybe that uh, the colors are a bit, I would say, less vivid on the right side. If you really zoom into certain things like this traffic sign in the background, you can find it's much uh, more dim on the, in the right side and such. Because it cannot represent all colors anymore the same way, but it's picked them fairly cleverly so you don't notice it that much. So, if you didn't notice, great. If you did notice, well, maybe using two colors well, instead of three is a bit, let's say, uh, aggressive approach to compression. Um, but we can't really go, well, let me put it this way. If you use three color components, we have no compression at all. And that's maybe a bit unnecessarily much. But if you use two, then maybe you have two aggressive compression. So, what do we do about this? We cannot take 2.5 numbers along this color dimension. So, instead, let's look at the other dimensions of the data. Because remember, we have a 3D grid. We can also look at uh, the row rows and the columns of the image. And because they are much longer, we have much more fine grained control, relatively speaking, of, over how much data we uh, discard over there. For example, the image I just showed you is 864 pixels wide. So, maybe uh, we can just find 700 components. Um, that actually, if you mix them properly using the right numbers, can approximate all of the rows in the image reasonably well. Um, this, I would say, is a principle of rank truncation, which is actually what we did earlier. In the, with the color example earlier, we uh, truncated uh, from the true rank, I would say, 3 to an approximation of the rank 2. Um, in this case, hypothetically, we're truncating from 864 to 700. But as you can see here, we have much more freedom over this data retention percentage because seven, because if we, we can change this value a bit more, a bit less to get a bit more, a bit less data compression. So let's repeat this procedure across all dimensions. So let's say we first compress the, the core dimension, or we don't, depending on how aggressive you want to be. Then you reduce the size of the data tensor along that axis, as we just showed two numbers instead of three. Then, if we go further, um, we also compress the row dimension, so this axis over here is shortened. Yeah, just following the exact same principle. I can't visualize it anymore because we're approximating 800 dimensional points and 600 dimensional spaces or whatever, but really it is intuitively, I would say, based on the same principle, so the 3D visualization is equally valid in my personal opinion. Uh, for the most part. And then finally, we also, using the same principle, uh, shorten this column dimension. Good. After repeating this procedure uh, across all eight dimensions, we obtain this small box I showed you earlier. We call this the core tensor. And this core tensor, combined with some extra information about the rotations we applied um, along the way before, as I showed you on this slide, I'll quickly go back. Yeah, so these rotations have to be stored somehow, so we, have to, so we are able to reverse them later on. And that's effectively what's stored in the factors. Yeah, good. Um, now, this core tensor is interesting because this contains almost all of the data that you have to store to re represent the decomposition. 
And actually, you might think, well, let's say we were able to, like in this image, half the size of the uh, data along each axis. Halving sounds good, but actually what we did is much more than uh, achieve uh, two times compression factor. We achieved a compression factor of eight, because we, of course, the amount of uh, numbers in here shrinks by a factor of eight if you shrink this cube by a factor of two along each size. This is how volumes work. And that's what makes the talkative composition so interesting, because um, if we, the core don't sensor dominates the total amount of data storage, and um, yeah, every pretty much we can multiply the compression factors together. So, uh, of course, we did throw away some information along the way. So many of you might be asking, well, isn't this uh, a bit easy? You introduce an error in the data, the data is distorted, are you still representing the same? So here's a practical question to answer this. I have a social experiment. You saw the original image uh, a few times in this presentation. Now, which of these images is the real one? Who here thinks A is the original image without compression distortion? Okay, who thinks it's B? Who thinks it's C? And who thinks it's D? Okay, so it seems like I think um, the most popular answer was C, but not, didn't, didn't have a majority for it, I think. So it seems like people do notice the error to some minor extent, but there are still plenty of people that were also fine with A, B, or D. Uh, and A was actually compressed 13 times. So it really depends on the setting and what the user wants, but in many situations, some error is totally fine. So this brings us to the end of our, let's say, general discussion about the Docker decomposition. Uh, it can be used to greatly reduce the number of, uh, well, the amount of numbers that we need to represent data. Uh, however, uh, the difficult question is that well, computers don't work with numbers in the abstract mathematical sense. If you ask a computer to store a decimal number or a real number, as we normally call it, um, it will, by default, in most settings, it will start with 16 digits of uh, decimal precision, so 16 digits behind the decimal point. And this is way more than we actually need. Before, I was just showing you the computations with only two de decimals, but in fact, the computer uses way more of them by default. And uh, we need these during the computations, but at the end, when you want to store data, we have to carefully think about how we represent these numbers. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have time to go into detail how you should do this, but there is uh, existing work on this. The, I would say the only Tucker-based compressor that properly does this uh, is T-Trash, well, before our work at least, uh, but it has certain shortcomings. Namely, the software is um, not as fast and not as memory efficient as it should be. Uh, from an implementation point of view, there are still some algorithmic accelerations possible, and also it's a bit hard to use, and uh, from a software engineering point of view, there were many issues with it, I would say. Um, so this leads us straight into my work. So the main portion of my PZ research was actually spent on the development of uh, ATC, the Advanced Tucker Compressor, which is a software library based on this T-Trash compressor that already existed, uh, on an algorithmic level at least, uh, however, we did make certain algorithmic improvements. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have time to explain any of them today, but it's explained in detail in my thesis. Uh, and on the implementation level, actually, I did do a complete overhaul, and uh, thanks to that uh, alone, actually, I already achieved some noticeable speed-ups and also less memory usage. And to be clear, memory usage is pretty important for software because if uh, ATC uses half as much memory, per element in the input data, it means we can actually uh, process twice as large input data with ATC. And also, uh, I my, made my implementation in a much more, say, generic way, such that you can do a lot more things with it from a programming point of view. Let's uh, look at some examples. Unfortunately, I don't have time to go into the improvements that we made, but I can at least visualize some results. So on the right-hand side, so now we have actually a compression factor of 11. Um, I would think this is better than with the standard techniques that we showed before, just using um, the Tucker decomposition without further processing. And there are, of course, some other examples we can try. We, uh, you can, I'm going to pause a bit so you can see if you find differences, but I personally chose the, rel uh, the error rates so that I think the differences are pretty much negligible at this size. So, yeah, and at that level, you achieve this level of compression. 
and uh, those are the last examples. Here we have the most compressible example, actually, uh, of 40 times. But it's also, of course, good to look at the kind of data that we are really interested in my research, even if it is a bit less every day. Um, so that those are, you know, scientific tensors, so to say. Uh, here we have uh, some simulation data. Uh, this is the original uh, data tensor, and I applied compression to it uh, with different errors, increasingly in uh, worse errors, actually. So the last one, you can start spotting difference with the first one, for sure. But apart from that, I would say the differences are kind of hard to see, and we were able to get to 3,600 times compression. So clearly, um, yeah, our techniques are very interesting in some of these uh, situations. Now, of course, as a scientist, you don't just look at these examples and say that our techniques are better or worse because of some images. No, what we do actually is to look at several data sets and aggregate results over many experiments, which is what I did very extensively in my thesis. Uh, there are many graphs there you can check out in detail if you want to know more. Um, the main findings were that if we compare our work to T-Trash, so the state-of-the-art Tucker-based compressor, uh, we achieve roughly equal compression, which doesn't sound too good, but actually it's, I'm quite happy with uh, the, our overall outcome because for equal compression, we get 2.2 to 3.5 times speed-ups, depending on whether or not you're doing compression or decompression. Also, we reduce our peak memory usage by about half, which is, and we also have much stronger control over the compression error that's um, actually introduced in the data. So effectively, when you tell ATC, I want to compress uh, this image or some image, and I wanted to have this error using some mathematical metric, it will quite closely approximate this error without actually checking uh, the data and decompressing to see what the actual error would be. Well, T-Trash is um, not so... It can't predict this very well. It's uh, usually off by quite a bit. Uh, so it's, it's possible that you tell it, I, I want this error, give me maximal compression at that error, and it gives you a much lower error. So in other words, much lower compression as well. Compared to other non-tensor-based but state-of-the-art compressors uh, that achieve really high compression rates according to, uh, relative to others, uh, actually it turns out that in some high-compression scenarios, as I call it, so either when working with highly nice, highly compressible, nice, data, smooth data sets like these, or when working with high compression errors, because of course everything compresses well if you don't care about what the result looks like. Um, well, in those cases, actually, Tucker compression achieves um, much higher rates, compression rates like 10 to 100 times higher than uh, the other state of the art techniques. However, uh, in other cases, uh, the other compressors are usually more efficient, and in general, the Tucker decomposition is simply computationally costly. So as a result, uh, if you care about speed, unfortunately, um, yeah, you should always go for the others. But if you are willing to sacrifice some speed for higher compression rates, uh, it depends on the data set. Finally, a little note about our software. Uh, since I spend a lot of time on this, and actually yeah, spend a lot of time on the software engineering aspects, so, oh, uh, the ATC library has extensive documentation. I implemented uh, several interfaces in multiple programming languages and also a command line interface so programmers can interface with the da database, uh, the library in different ways. And there are some other uh, software engineering features here for the programmers in the room. Um, and as a result of this, actually we submitted this uh, software as part of our uh, paper to a special journal called ACM Transactional Mathematical Software, which explicitly peer reviews the software and it's also published uh, there, which uh, I mentioned because it's uh, not how we usually do things in academia, uh, but in that way we valorized the software a bit more academically speaking. That leads us to the second uh, part of my research, luckily shorter parts. Uh, this is about acceleration of sparse tensor dance matrix chains. And yes, just like with the thesis title, I know uh, there are some things unexplained there for now, but I will uh, cover that in a bit. First of all, what are sparse tensors? Well, certain tensor data sets actually con mostly contain zeros, and I think mostly is actually an understatement if you look at this. Uh, for example, if you think about the movie lens data set, it is a database that stores movie reviews. So users give certain like five star reviews to uh, movies on certain days. If we uh, look at all of the entries in this database, and we store uh, some, let's say a user gives a f I don't know, five star review to movie number one uh, on day number two, and he himself is user number three. 
Then at position one, three, two, we will store the value of five stars or five in our tensor. Now, of course, most of these combinations are, don't exist because, of course, you don't have 60,000 users that actually reviewed all of the 160,000 movies on each one of the 1,200 1, days in, under consideration. Instead, uh, we only have 25 million of these reviews, but there are 11 trillion elements in this uh, full tensor. So actually, 0.002% uh, or one out of 450,000 uh, elements is not zero, and everything else is zero. Now, this is not such an issue to store because we have clever formats for that that ignore the zeros mostly. Uh, but the issue comes when we start doing computations with this. But to get to that point, I first need to explain the second difficult part about the title earlier, tensor times matrix chains. It's a long uh, abbreviation, but effectively, it's just this diagram that I showed you earlier. It's a key part of computing Docker decompositions where we apply this uh, well, rotation to the data along each dimension, and then often we also throw away some of the data at the back side. So this progression is a ten ta tensor times matrix chain along each dimension. Now, the standard way we compute this with dense tensor data, so not sparse tensor data, is just sequentially, like I showed you before. Let's try that with sparse data. Well, the input data is sparse, but we have clever formats for storing that, so we'll assume that's all fine in terms of memory usage. The final tensor we have to store is dense. I'll get into that in a bit. Um, but it is much smaller. It's compressed along each uh, axis. Therefore, it's also fine normally to store. The problem lies in the middle. If we apply these rotations and this compression sequentially, after one step, we have multiplied a dense rotation uh, matrix, it is actually, with this sparse tensor. And in general, that means we get uh, dense tensor data. But we've only compressed a single uh, axis of our tensor. And therefore, uh, in practice, you usually run out of memory by quite a lot. This problem has been investigated for, I think, 15 plus years by now. Many solutions have been proposed. I will skip straight to the specialized algorithm of Smith and Karipis based on the CSF data format. Uh, I'm not going, don't have time to really explain how it works, but the essence of it is that they store the tensor using this tree diagram, as it's called in computer science. It's a hierarchical kind of diagram. And, by traverse, and then if you uh, traverse through the tree, depth first, as we call it, so you go left, then go up a bit, you go as down, far down as possible, then you go up until you can go further, and so on. Um, and we do stuff along the way, passing data down, passing data up, we get our answer. The key point here about understanding the problem with this algorithm is, are these cubes? Mainly, uh, I drew these uh, boxes. Here you have a, a vector. Uh, now here you have a 2D tensor, a matrix. Here you have these cubes. Um, these don't just represent the data that's being passed around. They also are effectively proportional to the amount of arithmetic operations that need to be done in these steps where they're displayed. Uh, and this is very important because here we have this level of the tree, uh, which is a bit far down. We have six nodes on this level. And at each one of them, we have to do the heaviest operation in the entire algorithm, which is to work with these big cubes of data. All of these matrices and vectors before, they were much flatter, so to say, so they, they cost much less time. Um, so the problem is, why can't we um, work with these cubes at a higher level in the tree? Because here we have six nodes, but here at the top, we only have one node. On this level, we only have two nodes. So and with real data sets, the difference might be more like in between 10 million nodes on this level and maybe 100 on that level, for example. So this leads us to our adapted algorithm. Again, I won't explain the technicalities of what I did. Um, but the essence is that I move these operations as far up as possible. To, uh, I call this principle all accumulation. And uh, if you do an experimental analysis over several data sets, uh, we found the following results. So if you count arithmetic operations as additions, subtractions, all these things that you might have to do. Uh, it turns out there are two variants of TTMCs. I'm not going to describe them here, but let's say the first one is slightly more interesting. Uh, in that case, I achieve um, over half. Uh, I reduce the time and the amount of arithmetic required by over half. And the second case uh, for the other variation uh, is much greater reduction in arithmetic and a much smaller reduction in time. Uh, I won't get too much into detail there anymore because of time. 
But uh, the final observation is also that we have a, a huge memory reduction uh, in many cases of like 20 to 70 times less memory usage uh, with our software than the reference implementation of the state-of-the-art algorithm. Uh, but I think this is partially explainable by algorithmic differences, partially explainable by implementation differences, but also partially explainable uh, probably by a bug in, I think mostly explainable by a bug in their software, which I did not find, but I, it, it theoretically doesn't make so much sense. So take this with a grain of salt, but we also achieve memory reductions that we are certain about. This leads us to the end of our presentation. Um, we then go back to the title. I hope you understand a bit more of it now. Performance enhancing techniques for Tucker tensor decompositions in data processing. Well, tensors, I explained, are multidimensional grids of numbers. Then, Tucker decompositions are a specific way to decompose these tensor data sets into smaller components specifically suitable for data compression. The performance we're trying to enhance is uh, effectively how fast our computer is to run processing this data and perform these algorithms, how much memory it needs, uh, the compression rate that it achieves, the uh, amount of error control it has, all these things. And uh, finally, the kind of data processing we're actually looking at in this thesis is mostly data compression uh, and also in this presentation. However, uh, this research actually has uh, applications too within data analysis when you want to find insights in your data for other purposes. Uh, but I didn't have time to discuss that today, unfortunately. So finally, the last slide uh, where I summarize my research contributions. Uh, in the first part of my PhD, I worked on the ATC library, which is a state-of-the-art uh, high-speed uh, Tucker-based compression library for test tensors. It is uh, much faster, two to three times faster, than the existing state-of-the-art Tucker-based compressor, T-Trash. Um, it has half memory usage, 25 times stronger error control, uh, these things that I explained before. And also, I invested a lot of time in making the software package as easy to use as I hopefully could. And in the second part of the PhD, I uh, went a bit more on the algorithmic level. I didn't invest as much time in the software. I uh, thought more about algorithms and, uh, a bit. And here we achieved uh, also, I would say, overall, if you compare these uh, numbers, about halving of time and uh, arithmetic operations required overall. And finally, also, we have this large memory reduction, probably partially due to some implementation issues, but also partially because of really our implementation improving a few things. Thank you for your attention. Uh, this is the end. Uh, for on, if there are people online watching, they can send questions to this email address, and we will handle them if we have time after the questions from the jury. And uh, otherwise, I will um, answer questions from the jury. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bart. Dames en heren, na de presentatie van de onderzoeksresultaten gaan we over naar de eigenlijke verdediging, de discussie met de leden van de examencommissie. En ik wil u eerst de leden van de examencommissie voorstellen in de volgorde waarin ze met de kandidaat zullen debatteren. We zullen beginnen met dokter Albert-Jan Iselman van de Huawei Zurich Research Lab in Zurich, Zwitserland. En verder gaan we met professor Maria Isteva van de faculteit Industriële Wetenschappen departement computerwetenschappen. En dan gaan we verder met professor Lieven de Latauer van het departement elektrotechniek en de campus Kulak in Kortrijk en professor Raf van der Brul van het departement computerwetenschappen. En dan komen de twee promotoren aan het woord, professor Karl Meerbergen en professor Nick van Nieuwenhoven. Dr. Iselman. Dank u wel. En also thank you uh, Wouter for the great presentation yeah. uh, and Thank also you. of course for the thesis it was a pleasure to read it um, so maybe maybe first starting with Luna whom you introduced in your in your presentation uh, so if you uh, you know from the pictures that you showed and in particular maybe uh, slide 27 if we, if we could start with uh, uh, with that one mm. uh, I, I I don't think it's a um, yeah. Yeah, this yeah. one. Yeah, yeah. I don't think it's an unusual situation, but um, and as you also showed during the quiz, uh, it might seem to some people that compressed pictures might look nicer uh, than the original <laughs> picture. <right? laughs> so, yeah. so perhaps um, uh, one particular question could be: 
Uh, are there any metrics by which you are able to measure the error in the eye of the, uh, let's say, human observer? Uh, yeah, this is outside of my field of expertise, but of course, image compression and video compression is much, much uh, wider field that has been widely developed by many people in the past. So you have uh, other metrics like uh, SIM for, in, uh, for um, images, uh, VMIF for videos and some other things have been developed by industry based on their views of what is indeed uh, important or not. I think also in X265 and other video codecs they have, there are options to enable uh, I think what they call psycho uh, psychometrics based or I don't know, something based on the way humans work and our brains work um, and how psychological research has indeed uh, turned out that these things uh, work in our perception. But I think it's more psychology research and it's probably very tedious to do, so this wasn't really part of my right. work. Right, 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 right. I mean, uh, so, so again, from, from experience with, mm. uh, with, with com compression on mm. uh, daily media, uh, I, I do suspect, uh, like usually actually compressing quite a lot is okay for these kind of uh, uh, media that you have mm. for human consumption, precisely because a lot of errors we actually apparently do not. Yeah, I mean, perceive. I have maybe one idea what you might be talking about, which I think many people agree on, which is that humans. Uh, I mean, we focus more on the let's say low frequent, yeah, right. low right. frequent components, which. If you look at the factor matrices selected by SVDs and SDH SVDs and such, they usually put these uh, low frequent parts first. Uh, it's also why DCTs and such are used in uh, some other uh, compressors as well, of course. Right, right. Yeah, so I, I think it was uh, slide 42 that, uh, that kind of triggered this line of questioning for me. Uh, kind 42, of on the slide. yeah. Uh, yeah, I think it's, it's this one because uh, like your uh, third to last point, you're, you're actually saying that if you're doing tocco-based compression, yes. uh, you are particularly achieving good results in the high error area. Right, so well, I, I call it the high compression domain because if you look at the graphs, it's of course more in the high error area, but also in the same medium area or areas, as long as the data is well compressible, like here. Right. Uh, so that's why I use that term quite specifically in my work. Because I, my impression is that it's a combination of both uh, factors. Right. 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 So m might it be in uh, in, in your uh, in your impression a a interesting. Uh, future direction of research to try and, uh, how do you say, couple uh, the kind of errors that you're considering here, which are purely numerical, right, uh, to some of these error meshes that has been developed in these other lines of research uh, mm. and try and figure out uh, how well Tucker compression does in, in, in the kind of error metrics that... It is um, possible, um, but yes, of course, this goes a bit far um, out of my field, mainly because I do not believe that these other metrics have the same nice properties necessarily that we, of course, like to use with the Frobenius norm. Right. Um, it is a bit cheap, but I don't think I think the Frobenius norm is a fairly neutral choice uh, from a numerical point of view, at least. Uh, but yes, of course, we also chose it in part because you can do a very nice error control with it. Uh, and I mean, it's also used in signal processing. They call it P as an R over there, but it's equivalent. Um, many electrical engineers are using that too. But yeah, it, it is definitely a possible line of research. But I would have, I would have to read more papers to know how these metrics work and how they could potentially we could exploit their structure to still do something useful with them. Right. right. All right. Thank you. Um, so as, as the next question, I had one on. Uh, on section 5.4 in your thesis, but we don't need to uh, oh. we don't need to look at it. I okay. think uh, I, I, I also don't think that you mentioned it in the presentation this time around. But in section 5.4, you're uh, uh, describing the use of space filling curves, yes, uh, and they're used in uh, uh, in these uh, these types of compression methods. Uh, so could you maybe uh, intuitively sketch uh, why these might uh, might be uh, helpful? Uh, yeah, the main the idea is that I experimentally found that before I was uh, implementing this optimization, that in typical compression situations, the majority of the bits in the compressed output objects were spent on the core tensor encoding. Um, and of this, the vast majority as well on the leading bits. So all things considered, um, 
the storing the leading bit positions of the core tensor took up like I could say half of the compressed output in many situations. Um, so theoretically, if I found some way to perfectly order all of these um, coefficients from largest to smallest absolute value, we'd have this very nice profile, you could store it with a negative amount of data, and you would increase all compression factors by two. Um, so that was the, like the optimistic line of research in the first year of my PhD. Uh, and as it turns out, of course, um, I tried many kinds of other sorting methods uh, based on singular values and products of singular values and all these things. But it turns out that um, you have this hot corner phenomenon. It definitely concentrates the data in the corner with the, uh, the energy within the corner with the lowest coordinates. Uh, but you cannot really be sure about the ordering to some extent there. Um, it's easy that uh, uh, it often happens that you go up a bit and down a bit and up a bit if you look at the profile of leading this let's say in the core tensor. So yeah, the uh, general idea that was there just to hopefully order the coefficients in a way that they look more like they're in this order of descending absolute values, heuristically. Right, right, right. right. So in your thesis, you looked at the, um, I think you called it zigzag, uh, was yeah. it? Uh, as well as the, uh, the Z order. So in some, some other fields, people are using the Hilbert curve yeah. instead. Yeah, uh, that was a good remark. Of you. I, in all honesty, I added a uh, remark about it in my uh, final version of the thesis that needed as possible. In hindsight, since the other ones didn't work out so well and didn't lead to great improvements overall at least, in some situations, you get like five to six percent improvements, mm -hmm. but you don't know it a priori. Um, because of that, I'm not inclined to believe it's a very fruitful line of future research. However, if I were to spend my time on things before, I think the Hilbert curve is more interesting because at least if you ignore the um, jumps that might happen around bounds or something, it actually always advances to uh, an adjacent position. Uh, while with uh, Z order, it can jump quite far. And with the zigzag order, uh, in my implementation, it can also jump further. Uh, it's maybe possible to actually optimize that a bit further, but yeah. But I do, I'm still not convinced, based on the preliminary results I had there, that other curves would lead to drastically different results, at least. But I could be wrong, technically. All right. Thank you. Uh, and then with that, I wanted to move to the um, second part of, uh, of your thesis. So if you look at the... Um, uh, uh, well, section 7.5.4 in your thesis, but maybe slide 48 onwards might give a, a, a nice background illustration uh, there, or, or, I, or actually the experimental results, if you have them. I think you have them summarized on slide 50. Right, exactly. Uh, so you're, you're giving here the uh, aggregate results of your, uh, yeah. uh, of your work. If you look at the experiments in uh, detail, uh, then some, we can observe that sometimes your method mm. uh, is significantly faster than what is implemented in the standard SPLAT, and sometimes uh, SPLAT, right, so the standard CSF mm. is, uh, is, is slightly faster. Could you comment on whether we're able to detect or otherwise gauge when which method is faster? Like, yeah. it obviously depends on the data set, right? So This question also came up during the preliminary defense, of course, and also in your notes. So <laughs> I did think a bit about it. Uh, I also added a slight remark about it in the final thesis. But I have to admit, uh, based on a cursory analysis, cursory analysis, I cannot find uh, really uh, a strong explanation. Right. The first explanation I would look at is the dimensionality of the tensors under consideration. This was also already reported in the work of Smith and Karib, is that their method had issues with four or five dimensional tensors uh, if you had only one CSF representation. Because of this problem, I displayed uh, two slides earlier, of course. Um, and if you go to high dimensional tensors, you have even more of these deep levels. Um, so that was my hypothesis. And it does explain most of the findings, I think. But I think the LBNL data set, which is also four or five dimensional, uh, doesn't show this pattern in the, the graph. So uh, that's why I nuanced the claim a bit in the thesis. I have to admit, in this uh, part, it's 
Also, with the other methods we're comparing to, sadly, it is a bit hard to compare their performance. And I think it's a bit sad, for example, the hypertensor library is not per publicly available because all I have to go off to say that um, it's not the state of the art anymore is the paper of the CSF TMC people themselves. Right. So, unfortunately, these comparisons are, yeah, they do some, usually do some kind of uh, complexity analysis. Data movement is an interesting way to look at things too, but we didn't do that. Um, but yeah, I can't say too much about it, unfortunately. I've thought more about it since then, but this is my finding. <laughs> right, right. So that may be kind of, kind of close to wrapping up uh, uh, the questions I prepared. Uh, so as a kind of open question, so with your experiments, uh, or with your experience that you've built up uh, uh, with these uh, sparse tensor computations, uh, what would be a logical next step to take? Like, should we think about the data structure itself? I mean, your method is still based on compressed mm -hmm. sparse fibers. Is that the right thing to do? If, uh, you know, if not, uh, what would you suggest? If yes, what would be a good next step? Yeah, I have some ideas in this regard in the future work section, of course, but it's, I don't have ideas that I think are super promising in that regard. You can look into implementation further, of course, that in parallelizes, that's a big, uh, I would say, shortcoming probably, uh, if people want to build further on this research. Uh, and I do think that's maybe the most interesting thing. If you want to really improve the algorithms, mm, yeah, again, when I think about the data structure, a possible improvement has to do with the reordering of indices, but unlike with other sparse matrix algorithms, actually this does not reduce the amount of flops, it just it improves caching behavior and so potentially, depending on, based on certain research. Um, so I don't immediately have many things. What I was personally thinking about, uh, if I were to continue in this line of research, was actually to do the parallelization and also the implementation of the all LTTMC algorithm, which luckily recently found more use in a paper of Minster, I think, from that I only found in June, with a Konecker-based uh, randomization. Um, yeah, I think that would be more interesting because the ALLTTMC actually shows some potential for uh, another application of our leaf one out uh, principle uh, to reduce flops, uh, even in situations where you have multiple CSF representations. Uh, because at least we compute several of these uh, TTMCs in one tree, uh, in with one traversal, while other, with the other algorithms we would do traverse multiple trees. Thank you. Uh, maybe as a final question, so you did a lot uh, software-wise. Is it available freely for people to use? Uh, yeah, uh, for an ATC, I put a link here. I also managed to move the documentation last minute to, uh, uh, let's say, more permanent URL, as was suggested by certain members of the jury. Um, so luckily, that will also be staying at a better place now for a long time to come, I hope. Uh, and the sparse DMC code is also publicly available, uh, but that's more for scientific reasons. Um, so other scientists can potentially build upon it if they want or compare uh, in benchmark it, you know. All right, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, first of all, uh, Walter, uh, uh, thank you for the visual presentation. You have a very technical topic, but you managed to uh, represent it in a nice way, even though you say maybe for some people in the audience it's still technical. I think you did a very good job in presenting in an understandable uh, way. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so I also have a few questions. You mentioned a few types of applications and uh, a compression in uh, of uh, hyperspectral images or mm. medical images or video maybe. Um, do you have any idea in what type of applications your technique is performing better or is it actually independent on the application? Out of the applications that I showed, uh, I would say, of course, simulation data because uh, the sad reality is that real data is often a lot more noisy and messy than, and with artifacts and everything. Even data sets that are supposed to be meant for benchmarking, I've found to contain artifacts. Uh, so yes, the simulation data is always the easiest to compress. That's also my observation earlier. Um, but also for other compressors, of course. 
Okay. And another question that I had in, in terms of, let's say, uh, video surveillance. Huh? So you have a, a, a video that you want to compress uh, mm -hmm. in some way, but maybe the information that you're really interested in is in the residual. Can you do something with this? Like, for example, I here <laughs> it's an hour. If you take a, a video of it, it's most of the time it's empty, and then mm -hmm. people start coming. So the, maybe the difference between the compressed uh, version and the true version is the one that is uh, the most interesting one. And by compressing, mm. maybe you're losing some of it? Yeah, I definitely agree that the relative error on its own, or P is an error for Venus term, is not the best metric always to look at with these things. Which is luckily also why I did not actually do uh, performance benchmarks in my experiments on images or videos and such, because other algorithms are more suited for that. Uh, because yes, indeed, there can be one important part at some point in the video that gets completely blurred out because it's not so important from the perspective of the Frobenius norm as a whole. Um, in that sense, I suppose maybe some things you can look at are difference coding, for example. Um, so you then you uh, say decrease the impact of these lar long static sequences of images uh, because you, they just are encoded as zeros. Uh, if you only store the difference in between each frame, is what I'm trying to explain. Uh, in that setting, I think you will, relatively speaking, weight the parts with movement higher. Um, that's one simple idea I'm thinking about. Um, but yeah, I can't really say how it performs in this uh, setting because it, I didn't do experience with this and I also kind of believe with hundreds of researchers on video compression that it's not a very fruitful uh, direction for me to look into alone. Okay, and uh, maybe a more technical question is uh, we are currently having different uh, computer architectures and uh, I was wondering if you can make use of some new technologies or if you can think of some uh, architecture that could be more suitable for, mm. for your application. I have to admit, while my PG was more programming oriented, unlike some colleagues, I did not write assembly and did not go to that level of um, optimizing based on cache sizes and these things. So, yeah, I would say on a very broad level, of course, you want architectures with many threads, so you can parallelize things, at least in the first part with ATC. Um, in the, uh, as far as GPUs are concerned, I think oh, they are... I would limit their use personally to probably standard um, libraries that use them, like Magma for linear algebra and such. It's, it becomes much harder I've worked with GPUs, actually, but not for my PhD. <laughs> and it's difficult, I think, to get these algorithms to on there because they require a lot of data uh, to be processed, especially the second part of the sparse TTMCs. They generate a lot of data per arithmetic operation involved. So GPUs are not especially interesting from that point of view. And then in a larger setting, if we're thinking about maybe distributed memory computing, uh, that is, of course, also something to look into. I suppose I just made a bit of a choice uh, in my PhD that I was more interested in investigating shared memory parallelism. It's also a bit easier to implement, of course. Um, I have read some papers concerning distributed memory computing and their algorithm, algorithms involved there. And it can be interesting, but it's you know, another line of research. So I think we have some options there. And for example, if I think about ATC, how would you parallelize it in a distributed memory setting? Well. Uh, the linear algebra can be done, uh, I believe, or, well, for example, the Tucker compression could be done using Tucker MPI, which is made for this. And then the second phase, the brittle lane truncation, could be done with a more advanced version of our scheme that we already use for shared memory parallelism. But yeah, you again need to weight the communication cost even higher in that situation. So is that kind of what it's, uh, you were looking for, or am I answering in a completely different direction? Because <laughs> I'm not sure. Yeah, that's fine. Uh, and maybe one uh, final philosophical question. I also have. 
which parts, if you would to start your PhD now over, all over again, <laughs> oh <boy. laughs> which parts would you keep <laughs> and which parts would you do differently? Well, I would, you know, honestly, I don't think uh, my time was maybe not always prioritized correctly. It's, of, of course, very easy to say in hindsight, oh, that didn't turn out to be so fruitful, that did, and so on. Um, in some settings, uh, I think I knew from an earlier stage that or I could have the right discipline proven that, or reasonably assumed that, the optimizations I was working on would be relatively limited, and maybe it would have been better to scrap that and move on to something else. Of course, I could also talk about specific ideas like the Filbert curve instead of a Z order or something, but that's, I think, a bit easy to say in hindsight. Uh, but yeah, I, in general, I think maybe um, if I could give myself advice four years back, I would um, try to maybe really focus on things uh, where I have a st stronger reason to believe there are improvements. But you know, honestly, the Sparse DTM series research only came about with all of its uh, ex uh, speed ups because I spent months developing an algorithm before I actually got, um, let's say, a publishable results. So. In a sense, in research, it's also normal to be stuck for a long time. So, compared to, I think, other research, I think I should maybe think a bit more about how I spend my time. That's my answer. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Okay, thank you also from my side, uh, Walter, uh, for this nice, uh, attractive presentation. <coughs> uh, I have a few questions. Some have already been asked by uh, the colleagues, but uh, there are a few left. Um, let me start with uh, something uh, maybe a bit technical. Um, at some point, uh, you give as an example of a, a recommender system, uh, you discuss an application of a tensor completion with a movie lens uh, data. Ah, yes, right. Indeed. And there I have a question. Uh, if I understand it correctly, uh, you subtract the mean of the data, and then the mm. points that are missing uh, are put to zero. I don't do this actually for our data sets, but it's a, it's a motivation to um, motivate a choice that I consider this to be a sparse tensor data set within our context, even though it is technically incomplete. And technically, we should be trying to solve a slightly different um, optimization problem. But yes, uh, there has been at least some literature that uses this technique uh, it's a very basic linear algebra method to uh, build recommender systems. Yes, it's I, a bit strange. Eh? Uh, so what is the reasoning why they do that? I to subtract the mean because if you assume that all values that you don't know are zero, it's you're probably further from the truth than if you assume that they are somewhere along the median value of uh, mm -hmm. review uh, ratings in that setting. I think it makes sense that. Um, for example, if the average movie rating in database is three stars, um, that you're going to be closer to the um, you're going to be closer to modeling, let's say, the true tensor uh, in the unknown elements if you uh, assume the unknown elements are three stars and not zero, because else you're going to try to model a tensor and it's going to give you an output that, at least if you overfit it, is going to go to zero in those points, so to say. So. Mm. On the other hand, that. in that kind of applications, uh, it's not unlikely that actually a very, very large fraction of the data is missing. And if you all put them all to zero, uh, which is then, which corresponds to the average, it's a bit of a strange technique. Eh? Yeah, that's why I mm. think mm. the average is uh, I think average is slightly um, more interesting. I have to admit, if I have to talk about experience in this regard, it's somewhat limited. Um, I read the paper I cited, or um, the motivations for this in there, and the method that was used, um, and I think is a true method to, use <laughs> to build recommender systems, although one out of very many. Um, I can bring up some very old experience as a master student. Uh, actually, Nick gave me an assignment, and all the other students do, to build uh, an SVD based recommender system uh, with four matrices, not for tensors, uh, using the exact same technique. And yes, it did give you 
uh, some results much better than um, I don't know you would get by just assuming you, everything equals the average or something. So, okay, uh, let's uh, switch to a uh, next question. Um, uh, somewhere at uh, in the early parts of uh, your thesis, you say that um, you will focus on uh, tensors of low order, and uh, mm -hmm. the reasoning is that uh, uh, you will consider, well, at that point, uh, dense tensors, and hence uh, the order will typically not be high. Uh, but mm -hmm. aren't there uh, useful applications with? Uh, High order tensors that are dense and that need compression. I find it a bit difficult sometimes to. Yeah, I find it difficult to find data sets that actually. I try to look for higher dimensional ones, but if you look at typical papers within these fields that I studied, they pretty much all stop at five. Um, because, yeah, if you do a numerical simulation, you have three spatial dimensions one time dimension, one variable dimension. Uh, sometimes it's, I know of some higher dimensional examples in cases where you have parameters that can also be varied to produce different well, results. In, in that uh, line I think that is probably the direction to look into. Yeah, but well, yeah, in that line of thought, you might actually start from a very large vector or a very large matrix that you fold into a higher yeah. order tensor. This is also an option. I did this during my master's thesis, actually, also on tensor based compression. Uh, and the results back then, I don't think, were that special. Um, it's interesting if there really would be some kind of repetitive pattern with the same frequency along that dimension, of course, so you fold it in a nice way that you even get uh, a better structure in your folding. But yeah, I researched it back then. Uh, it's four years ago, I have to admit, I don't know it very well anymore, but I don't think the results were that special there, else I would have continued it in my PhD right away afterwards. Mm. At least for the data I was considering than hyperspectral images. Just for the sake of it, uh, assuming that you would study uh, tensors of uh, high order that are dense, uh, uh, do the people behind you have to redo everything from scratch or can they start from your work? Uh, Some of the algorithms of course uh, like the STTT or the STHT uh, can... I remember at the very start of my PhD I actually uh, tried to uh, rewrite Dthresh to uh, use a hierarchical Tucker uh, model instead because actually, uh, I think he gave me this book at the start of my PhD where we, uh, there were some nice uh, error derivations too. And you could also actually control the error very nicely uh, using sequential truncation. So in that sense, yes, that could be done. Uh, as the difficult part that I have thought about in the meanwhile is the second part, uh, the bit plane truncation or whatever, you way you quantize and encode things. Uh, you have to consider the sensitivity of each coefficient in your model. And in this sense, I can't reason off the top of my head uh, if it is still going to be equal everywhere in uh, tensor trains or other kinds of hierarchical Tucker trees because you're working with um, yeah, the data in a very different way than I'm used to. Okay. Um, your uh, thesis uh, is uh, a bit uh, special in the sense that um, you spent a lot of work on uh, developing the code and, and tweaking mm. and trying and then um, m making everything available uh, publicly. So m I'll take this as my last question, a bit uh, also a philosophical question. Uh, how do you look uh, at uh, that kind of work in the context of a PhD? Do you say uh, this is actually the most important part? Do you, are you a great advocate of uh, reproducible research? Do you think everybody mm. should put their software online? Mm. Uh, or is it you because um, it fits here? That kind of thing. Could you elaborate mm. a bit? Well, as far as everyone putting their software online, I definitely think it would be interesting if results were reproducible or we at least have the software, if not uh, the entire experimental framework that was used to reproduce results. So, for example, for the second part of my research, I definitely don't think that's high quality software, but it's still out there, so other people can look at it, modify it, and so on. And that I don't think is so difficult to do if you have uh, developed a software 
uh, if you don't have a huge sense of privacy or something about it. And I think it's kind of important maybe in the academic world as a whole. As for the whole part about the extensive documentation, automated test suites, automated build system and such, uh, no, I, I think these are really software engineering features that are not necessarily always beneficial in academia. Um, I mean, also with ADC, I spent a lot of time on this, but I don't know if the software will be used. <laughs> in honesty, uh, it would be interesting. I would at least hope that it gets used as a benchmark in some other compression papers, maybe in the future. Um, but the reality is still that it was developed more out of interest and out of demand. So in hindsight, is also why I actually spent a lot of my PhD not going that deep into this, because in academic context, it's it's harder to valorize. It's like I worked hard to get the ACM Tom's paper and that gets some some prestige and these things. Um, but all things considered, it was a lot of work. While maybe a second paper would have been <laughs> an easier and more uh, let's say straightforward. Uh, path. So, in an academic perspective, no. This, this came from my personal interest, I would say, in programming, which is also a, a bit more why I want to go to the industry and uh, yeah, develop software for problems that maybe come to me, so at least someone is using it. Um, so, yeah, I think that is my answer for the most part. I think it's interesting to do, but it, from a practical point of view in academic context, it's maybe not so valuable, unfortunately. Apart from putting the research code online, that everyone should maybe do for integrity reasons. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Professor Dalatov. Professor Van der Brille. Uh, um, Wouter, I have um, a question on the software implementation of uh, uh, of your algorithm ATC. Um, so when I'm, I'm I'm looking at the sections here, most of the sections I do understand um, what I mean, like interfaces, shared memory, and so forth. But there's one section, 4.4.1, which talks on the cutouts and downsampling. And um, yes. this section contained many um, things which I do not exactly know what I mean. So first of all, um, so and, and that's why I think it's a good opportunity so that you can explain me a little bit more. Um, so you say that in some settings only a part of the decompressed tensor may be needed. What exactly do you mean and can you give an example? Uh, uh, for example, uh, if you have a large tensor, it's stored in a compressed format and you only want to look at uh, let's say the time slices from time point 100 to 200 or something. You can do slicing along each axis and you can do this actually during the decompression, not afterwards, so it's more efficient if you, uh, because effectively this corresponds to a linear transformation of the data, so you can compose this linear transformation with the factor matrices that you apply during decompression. So you do a linear transformation on the factor matrices and then you get yeah only a part. Okay, I understand that. And you can also use other filters that are based on different weights and such. Yeah. And then you have, um, and then there are uh, several techniques. So uh, you can use the downsampling, the box, and the Langshaw's filtering methods. Can you explain what these three, yeah. um, what these three methods actually do? So downsampling, uh, simply if you downsample with let's say a factor of two, or as I mentioned, you just only take points, let's say, in a 3D tensor, you only take points 0, 0, 0, then 0, 0, 2, maybe 2, 0, 2, you know, every point that only has initials multiples of 2. Uh, so you ignore all the other values. In the box filter, you actually average um, everything out within the same, uh, let's say, section that you are downsampling away. And the Langshaw's filter is uh, another filter with a more complicated uh, curve that's involved. But yeah, effectively, if you were to represent these as matrices, I think the downsampling filter, uh, depending on how you define it, you have to transpose this matrix, but in essence, you have uh, some indices, and let's say we have maybe six values, and if we downsample with a factor of two, we only select every second value, and the other stuff gets thrown away. So, yeah. okay. effectively, these different filters uh, change this kind of matrix. So a box filter would, for example, put 0 0.5 and 0 0.5 here instead. So we take the average of this, yeah. and 0 0.5 here and here, here and here and here. And the Lanchos filtering uh, method um, has certain parameters to that I don't mention there. But it is based on a more complicated curve uh, than yeah, the downsampling is... Uh, 
there, this is better. Just like this, you could say. The box filter is more like this. And the Lanchos filter is more complicated with something that's, yeah, yeah. A bit more like that. I didn't choose the filters, actually. It was just chosen in Ttrash like that. It was easy to re-implement. So mm -hmm. I'm not that, they were from the visualization world, let's say, so they are to be used a bit more often. So I added the reference, actually, to the thesis uh, in response to your remark there to provide some more context. Okay, thank you very much. That was a very clear explanation to me. Um, <coughs> and then I have one more question on the experiments. Um, let's see where it is. Just a second. Yes, so um, it's section 4.5.5, so the rate distortion comparison. Um, you say that you observed that ATC and the trash perform very well in some cases, adequate in other cases, and poorly in some other cases. Um, do you have an idea why they sometimes perform very well and sometimes not so well? Um, because in my eyes, this would be uh, important for the practitioner to know beforehand whether the method will yes. work well or whether the method will not work well. I also well. thought a bit about this as for future work that I did not put in my thesis, but I thought about it in the last weeks. If you want to know a priori if your data is better compressed with Docker-based method or not, I would think you want to uh, heuristically and quickly determine or approximate uh, its multi linear rank. That, I think, is the essence. Um, I would just, I'm quite sure that the data set that didn't work, uh, didn't work out so well uh, had, uh, let's say, higher multilinear rank relative to their sizes uh, than the others. And how you can do this, maybe a priori, although this is not my research, I would guess with randomized sampling, you take a random sample quickly from the data along each dimension, you <coughs> compute, uh, let's say, the SVD of the, those factors. You can use that to get a very rough idea about how, let's say, compressible your data is along each dimension. Um, that is my personal guess, but I didn't look too much into this. Okay, so to conclude, uh, as everybody is asking philosophical questions, <laughs> I have one as well. Um, so suppose that you have um, half a year or a year extra, which is something that you feel like is not completely finished in the thesis or something that you really want to add to the work you have already done? Mm. Um, yeah, I've honestly thought mostly in terms of these two subjects because there weren't really other unfinished major separate topics that I did during my PhD that I didn't talk about here. So within that context for ATC, it could be interesting to uh, look at this um, sampling-based method to heuristically determine what's the best compressor and such. But it's a bit practically oriented. I think it's maybe more interesting if people are really using these compressors to then implement some heuristic that can quickly determine the use ATC or assets or something like that. Uh, in the other field, what I think could be more interesting is maybe the parallelization, because that is not just about implementation, it's also about algorithm design. Uh, and we have to then actually look a bit about at how we um, yeah, partition the, the work. Uh, I have a strategy in my head that's roughly based on uh, the same uh, principle as Smith and Caripus, uh, but there were still some uh, things to consider about memory usage and such, I remember. Um, I had actually another major thing with ATC that I feel a bit um, should have been implemented, but again, if I wanted to really make it better software, I worked on rank truncation to speed things up. I worked on parallelization of plane truncation to speed things up, but I didn't actually implement uh, randomized sampling, which I think is a major technique to, imp to uh, speed up Tucker compression. Uh, I did it even during my masters. It's not some results then. It's widely studied uh, that it can be useful in especially more compressible data sets, um, but I didn't do this during my PhD. I think I was a bit scared for my masters because there I uh, didn't deal off deep enough to figure out how I should determine my sample size properly and there were some other issues as well. Um, but in hindsight, especially with this new research that I found about uh, randomized sampling, it seems like a possible route to, if you really want to speed things up further. But okay. at that point it might be a bit practical. I don't know. Thank you uh, very much. Thank you, Professor.
Uh, water, uh, no philosophical questions from my side, but let's think about the future, because we're now living in the present, and we have to think of other work, maybe not for you, but for people coming after you. Mm. Um, there have been questions about sparse tenses, about dense tenses, but let's now assume that the tensor is something in between. Um, the tensor is a sparse matrix that is parametric, that depends on parameters, and you can represent it by a high order tensor which is sparse in two directions and dense in the other directions. Mm -hmm. So what do you think would the best approach be, for example, for compression in that situation? Well, um, as for the TTMCs, I think in that sense it's easy to go for some of the other established methods like the method of Basca and Adal um, that are actually work with these semi-sparse tensors. I think they call them semi-dense tensors, but it's the same concept as what you described uh, with certain dense modes, certain sparse modes. Uh, along the dense modes, of course, the multiplication is quite straightforward. Along the sparse modes, uh, it's a bit more complicated, but I think they worked that out. Um, as for compression as a whole, of course, you still need to do randomized sampling then. Uh, so, sorry, you still need to figure out your um, your basis uh, that you are choosing then to actually use as a factor matrix. In that sense, uh, since it's probably a bit expensive to compute a full SVD, I would think about, again, randomized sampling methods to determine the, um, let's say, reasonable factor matrices within a reasonable amount of time. Mm -hmm. And suppose the, the matrix, if you look at the matrix, it's very large. What would mm. you do then? Well, of course, uh, you can go a bit further and start uh, doing this adaptive cross approximation things with the yeah. maximum volume heuristic. I've heard of in some cases where yeah, it's really expensive to work with uh, too much of the data. Um, well, I may have a suggestion th with uh, vectorizing the sparse matrix into a linear array be a good idea. So you take all the non-zero entries of the sparse matrix, you put them in a vector, hmm? and then each element is a tensor, a small I mean, Would that be, you get a dense tensor in that case, would that be a good idea, you think? If you simply vectorize them, but you lose a structure, so yeah. if the tensor dimensions uh, modes have some meaning to them, I would say. I would say you're losing information. Um, I'm personally not convinced that uh, effectively you're storing a, your sparse tensor uh, using a coordinate format in that case. Yeah. And that I did not find to be particularly efficient. Um, yeah, I would say you're throwing away information that uh, relates different data points to each other at that point. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, then one final question. You mentioned um, in your future, possible future work, you mentioned, open, um, you mentioned shared memory, so the parallelization. Mm. Um, now we know that for sparse matrices, it's not so easy. Um, you easily hit the, uh, yeah, speed up limitation due to arithmetic intensity. Mm. What is the situation in the case of sparse tensors? Is it worse or is it better? <laughs> well, I would say the issue doesn't get much worse than it already is <laughs> maybe in the current uh, situation because our throughput is, of course, abysmal by some people's standards here, I assume. Um, so I'm not especially afraid in that setting. Uh, the nice thing about the parallelization method that Spin Creep is proposed and also that I would like to, well, I would work on if I had to do it, uh, is that you partition the tensor at least into different uh, sections, the tree into different sections, and you, let's say the tree has D dimension, uh, D, D level, so you have D modes in your tensor, then you, each thread needs to access D contiguous sections of memory, um, with maybe some incontiguous parts in between, um, to get all of the data it needs from the tree. So in that sense, there is some splitting in between the data, uh, and you don't have these threads uh, working on the same memory as much, which can be used in some cases with caching and such. But overall, I believe in terms of data movement, the algorithms uh, that were developed, and also my algorithm, uh, really don't take it much into account, and it needs, it's probably more important to do that. So if you would parallelize it further, this, I think, would be a research question of its own, almost, to consider that more. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah.
All right, thank you, Wouter, for the nice presentation. I like the pictures of Luna. Every presentation should have at least one cat and one theorem, evidently. Um, so over the past years, I have had several opportunities to ask you questions. So I will refrain from asking a technical question. However, uh, to complement Professor Meerbergen, I will ask a philosophical question. <laughs> Which part of the PhD program, it's a four-year program, it has given you quite some um, responsibility, teaching with students, supervising master theses, um, interacting with your colleagues at conferences, and so on and so forth. Now that this chapter is coming to an end, I wonder what's the aspect you will miss most about the PhD program? Mm. I would say, it, if I look from it, at from a time perspective, the last two years were definitely um, nicer than the first part, because I was often, you could say, lost and didn't really know where to continue. Uh, it was quite demotivating at times in the first uh, two years. But uh, once I go into the sparse TTMC research, and it actually took off and I had some decent results, uh, a bit less than two years ago, I was pretty much settled for the rest of the PhD, at least. Uh, since I kind of had a direction to go for, and I saw a bit of a plan until the end, you know. Uh, and also, of course, the COVID aspect was maybe a bit less uh, interesting from a social point of view in the first half of my PhD. So, um, what will I miss the most? I definitely think that teaching responsibilities indeed have uh, Actually, some, some teaching responsibilities I liked, some I did not, as probably many of my colleagues know. Um, overall, I definitely thought it was a useful experience, though I've, it actually has taught me many skills. Um, because I've spent a lot of my life, of course, like most people, I think, developing my technical skills. And the PhD, despite, I think, its reputation as... Many uh, people in the industry apparently have their, uh, view that PhDs uh, are extremely technical people with no communication skills and such. Maybe that's true, but at least we practice them a lot more than in the industry, actually. I know this from friends, because I know what they do at their jobs, and they're programmers. So, in that sense, maybe I thought that was quite valuable. And also, the presentations I gave, the reports I wrote, the papers I wrote, um, yeah, I do value that. But as far as what's most interesting, I would say probably some parts of teaching, and in terms of research, Probably, uh, let's say, more relaxed parts where I could um, have the rare moments when I had a good direction of research, where I was getting good results, um, but I was not, uh, I don't know, in some hurry for some deadline for uh, some report or something, maybe, where I could work on it a bit more. Okay. Thank you, Professor van Dievenhoven. Full start it for the Leader of the Examen Commissie. No more questions. Dames en heren, er is een publieke thesisverdediging. Dat betekent dat u ook de kans krijgt om een vraag te stellen of een opmerking te maken. This is a public defense. That means that you also have the opportunity to ask a question or to make a comment. Are there any comments or questions? Zijn er vragen of opmerkingen? Ga uw gang. I uh, focus on topical decomposition because, again, the focus of the data I was looking at was of what uh, we in tensor world, I guess, call low dimensional data, so max five dimensions usually. Uh, and in that setting, the topical decomposition is doesn't hit this, the problems with the course of dimensionality as much, um, which um, I think make it DT and uh, and HD methods uh, dominate more uh, for higher dimensions. Of course, even with these lower dimensional tensors, you can consider what a TT can do. Um, I, again, I don't like talking too much about my master's thesis because I don't think the research there was uh, extremely rigorous, but I did explore uh, several of these ideas. And I also explored this idea, and the preliminary research then, again, 
from my perspective, the images um, did not seem to give me extremely promising results. I think maybe I got slight improvements sometimes, but it was hard to really find a, a clear, let's say, improvement from that. So my conclusion was that at least as far as I could see, I didn't see clear improvements. And also some academics simply say that look at tensor Tucker decommission is the standard method for compression for low dimensional tensors, for high dimensional use this and that. Uh, so I effectively followed that. Uh, it, I, actually, the Solomon PhD also looked at the uh, hierarchical Tucker a bit. Um, and again, I don't, it's four years ago, so I can't say it for certain, but I don't think the results were that promising as I would have done something with them. Okay, thank you. Any other comments or questions? Yeah, I gone. Depends on the computer you're running it on, of course. Um, I don't honestly have to maybe go over here. Uh, so 100 to the fourth times 8, you said? Uh, so I guess we'll, that's 8 times 10 to the 100. I could look at a data set of similar size over here. Yeah, but I always did research in a relative setting. I just uh, had my... <laughs> Uh, scripts uh, determine average gains and all this stuff. So uh, I think if you're looking at that order, I'm quite sure you're looking at uh, minutes uh, or I mean, it depends on the compressibility too very much. If you can achieve a good uh, cutoff in the first um, step of your SDH SVD, everything else is peanuts. Uh, if you don't, you can easily spend, I guess, five times as much time because you need to do uh, four other modes and then also the quantization and such. Um, so yeah, it really depends on the compressibility of the data and the, the relative error you evolved to, I would say. But what I remember from my ATC experiments, uh, I think for the largest data set, I needed to schedule on the VSC 72 hours at least for the experiments, but that's not for one, of course, that's for hundreds and hundreds of runs. So. Um, yeah, I think the um, average com time for a compression and the decompression, because they were always coupled, was probably of the order 10 minutes maybe, but it's really, really rough. It could be an order of magnitude within that range. Thank you. Any other question or comment? Can we quickly check whether there were questions online? No questions. Oké, okay, dan zal de jury zich nu terugtrekken voor de beraadslag. We komen terug als we een beslissing genomen hebben. Dames en heren, achte collega's, ik geef u kennis van de uitslag van de beraadslegging van de examencommissie aangesteld voor de proef van dokter in de ingenieurswetenschappen. De heer Wouter Baart heeft aan de faculteit een proefschrift voorgelegd handelend over performance enhancing techniques voor Tucker tensor decompositions in data processing. En dit wordt verkregen van de graad van dokter in de ingenieurswetenschappen. Heeft dit proefschrift in een openbare zitting voor de examencommissie verdedigd. De examencommissie heeft vastgesteld dat zowel aan de wettelijke en decretale bepalingen als aan de voorschriften van het universiteitsreglement ter zake werd voldaan. Na beraadslegging verklaart de examencommissie dat de heer Wouter Baart voldaan geeft aan alle eisen voor de proef en de graad van dokter in de ingenieurswetenschappen behaalt. Bij gevolg, in de naam van de rector van de KU Leuven verleen ik u de graad van dokter in de ingenieurswetenschappen richting computerwetenschappen. Proficiat. De zitting is gesloten. Dank u wel.
Dames en heren, gaat u nu zitten. Het is de gewoonte dat een van de promotoren het woord richt tot de nieuwe dokter. En professor van Nieuwenhuizen zal dat nu doen. All right, I'm uh, less mobile with this gown, but uh, let's make do. So it's my great pleasure that I will be the first person to congratulate Dr. Wouter Baart on obtaining his PhD degree. And it should be stressed, of course, that obtaining a PhD really is a milestone uh, that cannot be underestimated. It's unfortunately the case that research is not a linear process. You can spend a lot of effort into doing research and ultimately the output of this effort will be maybe one line in the PhD text. Maybe you will even have to cut the line from the PhD. So this is of course to appreciate all of the efforts made by Wouter. And I will continue by briefly sketching uh, the process of the PhD. So it actually started before the PhD. Uh, my first email from Wouter, actually also addressed to Professor Meerbergen, uh, was on the 29th of June in 2018, when he was inquiring about what type of uh, papers he should read for preparing the master thesis. So he was doing a master thesis with uh, the two of us, and he wanted to know, okay, what should I uh, read uh, in these papers? And so, of course, we sent back some papers that Wouter uh, would read. And during the next academic year, Wouter then worked on his uh, master thesis, which actually was uh, on the topic of studying this tea trash uh, compressor that uh, was featured uh, very clearly in the presentation. And after this year has passed where he worked on the master thesis, at the end, of course, he defended the master thesis. And at that time, the results were looking quite promising. And I was at that time looking for a PhD student. So I started uh, my professorship in September 2019, which would also be the starting date for Wouter. And so, you know, the opportunity presented itself. And I remember that we walked actually from the defense. I was giving some feedback about the, the results of the master thesis. We came to the computer science building and in front of the building, we had a bit of a chat and I asked him, would you perhaps consider um, applying for a PhD position with me for the next four years? I promise it's going to be great. It was great. Um, I don't know if I made the promise it was going to be great, but <laughs> nevertheless. Uh, so Walter took a few days to think about this and then uh, ultimately said, okay, I, I will do this, I will do this PhD. And at some point uh, he sent me an email when he was making the application with Arenberg Doctoral School and he said, uh, they need a title and a subject. And I was like, I will see what's going to happen. You know, as a tentative title, you can put performance enhancing techniques for tensor decompositions in data analysis which is up to two words, the exact same title that uh, Wouter defended here. Uh, and in fact, the title was only changed just before the, I think even uh, the preliminary version of the text uh, still had analysis in the title. Yeah, exactly. So you, you change it to uh, processing at that time. Anyway, so um, after uh, being approved by ADS, fortunately, um, he started his PhD. And the starting date of the PhD was uh, very, very well chosen. It was the 2nd of September 2019, which is in fact a K. Leuven holiday for Leuven Kermis. So he went off to a very festive start of the PhD. Um, so far, so good. Then in the, you know, the idea of the PhD was let's quickly wrap up the results from the um, work that he did in the master thesis, but People who know Wouter will know that he's very meticulous and said, you know, it would be better because now the code is in Python, it's not really coded very well, it would be better to do this in C++. It would be much more uh, representative, to which I agreed. And so it was decided, okay, you know, you can first start out by refactoring the code to C++. This process, unfortunately, took more of the time than we had foreseen. 
And during this period, there was also something else going on, namely some type of global pandemic. COVID-19 had hit us in about March of 2020, so everything went into lockdown. Um, while this evidently was a very difficult period for everyone, and I can imagine very much for PhD students, um, being isolated from probably the only people in the world that realize how frustrating research can be, I guess. Um, well, I, I know. So, nevertheless, I, I still had some vivid memories of this, uh, of this period. I remember uh, that the spring that year was particularly good. So, I was outside in my garden um, having online meetings with Wouter. So, probably you saw some of the, the surroundings, actually. And I also saw some of your surroundings, so I know that you were um, sharing the office uh, with your now wife, uh, then it was not yet your wife. And uh, what was uh, frequently happening was that we were having simultaneous online meetings. Your wife was having her meeting, we were having our meeting. So uh, sorry, Larissa, for disturbing you. If she's here, she's here, yes. So very sorry for the disturbance. Um, <laughs> Nevertheless, they were very productive uh, meetings. Great. So, you know, after this period, by the summer of 2019, um, the results, let's say, from the reprogrammed ATC were uh, in, and they were looking, let's say, less promising than during the master thesis. And this presented somewhat of a conundrum, namely, do we say, let's stop here and throw away one year of work? Or shall we try to pivot and let's say we go for some type of mathematical software journal where we can still valorize the results that were obtained. And ultimately it was decided in, let's say, the end of the summer, let's do that. Let's go for these uh, transactions on mathematical software. Now, this, I should really stress, it's really a very good journal and they have very high standards for the software. So it took about another year to wrap up um, you know, making the software up to standards for the ACM TOMS, including documentation, several interfaces to other programming languages, uh, and so on. So this process naturally took some time. And ab about after a year, we were finished with this process and, of course, with writing the manuscript. I'm sorry that we probably had, uh, like, five revisions of the manuscript. You probably thought... This guy is never going to be satisfied and will not let me submit this, but it happened. Uh, and in fact, on July 13, bad date, don't do this, July 13, uh, 20, uh, 2020, one, 2021, you submitted the paper to ACM TOMS. In this period, um, you had the opportunity to work on the second topic of the PhD, uh, where you actually Wouter came up or identified the problem in the literature, came up with a solution for the problem in the literature. So this is really the moment where I would say, this is what you want your PhD student to achieve, that they identify what is wrong in the literature, they figure out a way to fix it, and then they do it, right? So this was really for me the moment like, okay, Wouter's going to get a PhD, no worries there. Um, but there was this one little tiny detail still going on, namely we actually did need a publication as a formal requirement for the PhD. And as mentioned, we just submitted in 2021, in July, the paper. And it took until December 15 of 2021, so about one year and a half before the conclusion of the PhD, that we got the reviews. And unfortunately for us, those reviewers were also very meticulous and they identified several major items to be improved in their opinion, including some additional experiments, which Wouter then had to perform, reanalyze, put in the paper, um, taking again quite some time until we resubmitted in May of 2022. So about one year before you should uh, submit the text. And so by the end of the summer, I was getting a little bit nervous. Um, I don't know if Wouter knew I was nervous, but I was getting a little bit nervous because time was uh, running out. And so a brilliant strategy was uh, concocted by the supervisory committee. And the idea was, well, there is this 
there exists a conference series called ICNAM, and they have conference proceedings. ICNAM, I can say, is not uh, a super high-level conference, but it's one of those few conferences that has conference proceedings. And so, as a punishment for Wouter's uh, behavior, he had to write this conference paper and had the terrible, terrible assignment to go in September of 2022 to a nice Greek island of Crete, the city of Heraklion, where probably every day it was 30 degrees, and he had to present his work, because this was a requirement for getting the paper accepted in the proceedings, he had to present the work in this five-star hotel with swimming pool in Heraklion. It was a real punishment. Uh, anyway, so the paper got accepted there, and then later, fortunately, in December uh, 14 or 15, 2022, we got the, the final acceptance for the Tom's paper, which was great. Uh, and then from this moment, uh, you wrapped up the text and got to this point where you are right now. Uh, I should mention, not only has Walter taken, of course, a PhD in uh, engineering science. In some way, I've taken at least a bachelor in Wouter, I would say. And if I had to use one word to describe Wouter's scientific work, I would say that he works very meticulously, nauwgezet in Dutch. And uh, there is a funny story, the funny story of the meeting with Janssen's Pharmaceutica. Now, this is really funny because the fact that I can say that there was a meeting with Janssen's Pharmaceutica is precisely the effort of the meticulous work of our... Oh, he's already starting to crawl behind... Okay. Uh, sorry, what? I, did, I didn't catch that, what did you say? Oh, yeah, 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 I, I'm getting there, I'm getting there. <laughs> I mean, we have some time, right? Uh, anyway, so... The story of the meeting with Janssen's Pharmaceutica, I'm going to say this name a lot because, you know, you worked for this and um, I can do it. Great. So the story starts when there was some type of uh, career event. It was, uh, I don't know exactly what it's called, but it was some career event on uh, data science. And Walter decided, you know, my research is about data science. Why don't I go there? I pitch my research. Uh, and that's what he did, so he made a beautiful poster, he gave a brilliant, uh, I'm told, I was not there, he gave a brilliant pitch about his research. Uh, what I do know is it must have been brilliant because he actually won that competition, right? So the people from Janssen's Pharmaceutics, they were impressed with the research Wouter was doing uh, on the ATC, so the first part of the PhD, and they decided, okay, um, as part of the reward, they wanted to have a meeting with Wouter about his research and about other topics which, in fact, I cannot disclose. I guess, uh, I'm not 100% sure. Um, but Wouter was, of course, and understandably so, very enthusiastic about you know, winning the competition and having this meeting with Janssen's Pharmaceutica, uh, so much so that he told uh, some people about the existence of this meeting. Now, after a few weeks, Janssen's Pharmaceutica, as it goes with big companies, they want you to sign an NDA, a non-disclosure agreement. And in this non-disclosure agreement, a document that prob probably no one ever reads, except maybe from the legal people at LDR um, and Wouter, uh, so Walter read this document, and in this NDA, there was literally the statement that you cannot disclose that there would be a meeting with Janssen's Pharmaceutics and yourself. And so Wouter, um, again, most people would just let that slip and say to the people they told it to, shut up about this meeting, you didn't know shit. Uh, but Wouter said, no, 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 I will email to LRD, so you may had some email exchanges about removing this line from the ND just to make sure that everything was legally in order, right? So for, it's for this reason that I can, I'm legally allowed to confirm there was a meeting with Janssen's Pharmaceutics, which is, thank you. So I think I mentioned them like 10 times now just because of your hard work. And you thought I wouldn't bring this up, but it's there. Um, great. So starting to uh, wrap up, aside from the meticulous um, working ethic, Wouter's research resulted in uh, two publications. The main one is, is, of course, what he presented mostly also here um, in the Tom's paper. And I should mention really, I mean, this is really a, a big achievement. So Tom's has these um, type of what is called an algorithms paper. 
It's essentially kind of pieces of certified software in applied mathematics. And Wouter is the proud owner of algorithm 1036. OK, the, the number isn't very sexy, but he's the proud owner of algorithm 1036, ATC, uh, and so on. So there's only somewhat like 1,100 algorithms that are somehow certified. And Wouter has one of them. So he should be uh, definitely proud of this. I shall also mention the code that he wrote for ATC. I don't know if you counted it. I counted it. Well, I let my computer count it, uh, evidently. Um, contains 13,933 lines of code. If you want to have an ID, thank you uh, to Albert Jan for this ID. If you want to have an ID how much that is, well, that's the thickness of the booklet of your PhD. So it's about 233 pages of code, which is, in fact, more than um, the 208 pages in the PhD. So it's really a, a huge achievement. And in fact, uh, the a ACM also recognized this. And they have this batch. I don't know if you've uh, seen the batch. So your code has been awarded a batch uh, for, now I'm going to have a look. There's a citation that goes with that. Um, you have a batch for artifacts evaluated reusable. So there's a first level functional, there's a second level reusable, and it states the artifacts associated with the paper are of a quality that significantly exceeds minimal functionality. They are very carefully documented and well structured to the extent that reuse and repurposing is facilitated. So, Fortunately, also the ACM, at least to some extent, recognizes all of the hard work that you put in. And finally, now really wrapping it up, not only did Wouter, of course, do a lot of uh, research during his four years, but we should definitely also thank him for the various educational activities he carried out. Specifically, uh, a lot of work, I think, went into the uh, Technische Wetenschappelijke Software as a TA, the projects, the uh, homeworks and so on. And in addition to this, he was also the TA for Fundamenten for the Informatica and also for Computer Gestern Problem Oplosser, though not in the final year, I think, right? You were able to. Yeah, okay. So you were able to get rid of most of that. But, okay, that's, that's a very significant teaching load. He also supervised two master's students. I won't talk about them, but one of them was really <laughs> funny. <laughs> the first one. <laughs> We, I'm not going to go there. You probably have nightmares about this uh, um, to this day. Hopefully not, but who knows. Uh, yeah. And then uh, finally, aside from the teaching, he also took care of our security. Namely, he was member of the first aid and the first response team, so also volunteering work for the department. So in conclusion, thank you again, Wouter, for the hard work during the past four years, not only in research, but also in teaching and in taking up some responsibilities within the Department of Computer Science. For this, I also have two items. One item by the Department of Computer Science. Uh -huh. Yeah, getting a PhD is not so simple, huh? you see. You have to stay there for 10 minutes, 15 minutes, or more. So this is from the department as a token of appreciation. And then, of course, there is a mini tensor, a compressed tensor, if you like, um, that you can carry around or not to remind you of the four years here. Thank you. Well, Nick, thank you for the kind words. Actually, I did not expect such a long and funny story. Um, I have to admit, I spent um, most of my weekend in Python, JavaScript, LaTeX, and other things, and not writing this speech right now. So all I have are the notes that I just scribbled here. Uh, so unfortunately, there are no funny anecdotes, even though there probably were some uh, interesting stories from the past four years, but I'm not going to go through the effort of uh, finding the best one right now. So I'm going to keep uh, things more standard. Uh, if you, this is the part where the PG student, of course, thanks everyone involved, and I am definitely very happy to do that. Uh, in fact, I was very happy to do that, and I wrote four pages of that in my PG thesis, which is a bit longer than average. Um, so here I'll do the short version. 
Of course, first of all, I want to thank Nick, uh, my uh, PG supervisor, um, for actually, I need the last five years, although more intensively the last four years of uh, collaborations. Uh, we had probably, we had meetings usually every once or two weeks, so we could, you can calculate uh, just the amount of time that went into that. And also, whenever I was working on presentations or uh, manuscripts or something, um, he would all, once I sent them to him, he would very quickly reply and also with very thorough remarks. I didn't like them at first, of course, like all PhD students, um, but I think they actually improved things and they probably uh, saved me some work with referees for sure. So I'm definitely very grateful for that. But also in terms of your attitude, I'm quite happy that um, you were always, I would say you were always very optimistic towards me and you, when I wasn't sure what to do, you always had the right spirit, so to say, to continue with something else or I don't know. I remember in the first year of PG, especially, I just uh, sometimes when I was stuck, I just went could go into your office, and you usually were available to discuss things. So thank you for that. And I could, I think, thank Nickel uh, for a lot of things, of course, as is usual if you work together with someone closely for four years. Uh, but I will continue. Uh, in the broad sense, I also want to, of course, thank my colleagues here, especially in the last two years. Uh, I have to say, I really felt at home here in Numa. And uh, actually, if I have to say something I will miss the most about uh, this time, it is indeed this um, the social aspect with uh, Numa and even other colleagues from other groups. I didn't mention this before with your question, Nick, because I assumed you were talking about work and not other things. But <laughs> oh, well. um, so yeah, the many game nights, uh, hikes, other things that are organized, uh, especially happy about. But more to the point, um, if I really want to thank the people that helped me to, to get to this point, I really have to talk about my family and certain friends who, especially in the last year, uh, have meant uh, so much to me, and I would actually say to my wife too, at, as, to us as a whole. Because at home has been very busy in the last year, or one, last one and a half years, with certain busy and less busy periods with our house, renovations, now the birth of David, and also uh, my PhD wrapping up. And I am absolutely certain if when I say that I could not have finished all these things when I finished them, including my PhD. And I wouldn't be standing here right now uh, if I did not get uh, so much help with uh, all the things you can read about in the preface of my thesis. And finally, of course, also in this uh, line, I want to thank my wife, Laisa, who I would actually say maybe sacrificed the most uh, apart from me in the sense that she did not sign up for this. Uh, this uh, I signed up for a PhD, Nick signed up to be my PhD supervisor, um, but I think I'm very grateful for all the flexibility Laisa has had over uh, the last years, and it, I think the PhD has definitely had some influence on uh, our family life sometimes. Um, and. Although I'm not intending to continue that, and I want to, want to change some things, I'm extremely happy uh, that she has supported me so many times, also when I was having difficulties with my work. And that's just talking about my work, of course. The other stuff I discussed at our wedding, so. Um, yeah, I think that's the part, the most important uh, parts about uh, gratitude. Uh, that means we're reaching the end of the session. Um, so. It's not just the end of this session or the end of this PhD for me, it's also uh, probably the end of my time here at Kyle Leuven. I was a student here for five years, and a PhD student for four years. I was spent nine years in the Department of Computer Science effectively, so I'm actually very happy we can wrap it up over there. Uh, I didn't get the auditorium, unfortunately, but at least I got the foyer to do the reception, the more important part. So uh, that's where we will be heading next, uh, and I hope you will enjoy that. And if you want to speak to me, uh, of course, uh, feel free to do that. Uh, but maybe uh, we could do it over there so I can wrap things up over here. And yeah, I think those are the practical things. If you're an outsider, you don't know where the foyer is, just follow uh, that group of people over there or my colleagues. Uh, they probably know. So thank you very much uh, for being here uh, in this important moment. And I hope I will speak to you later.